Welcome everyone to Pencil vs. Pixel. My name is Caesar, and I have the pleasure of being joined today by Joe Ledbetter, illustrator, toy designer, and artist from straight out here from, from LA. Hey Joe. Hey, what's up Caesar? Welcome to the show. Thanks man, it's good to be here. So Joe has produced a ton of work and has collaborated with companies such as Kid Robot, The Loyal Subjects, and Nike, just to name a few. Uh, so Joe, before we continue, gonna ask you pencil or pixel I'll have to go with pencil on that I mean everything I do starts with a pencil um, pixels I do a lot of digital stuff too but um, you know it all starts with a pencil and you know pixels for me it's more about execution but pencil it's it all comes down to like creativity and and that's where just it all starts so I've got to say pencil sweet love that choice so Joe, go ahead and tell us a bit more about what you do and uh, well, who you are. Um, what's, what's your story? Well, um, my story, uh, I'm from LA. I was born here. Um, I lived in, well, I lived in Pasadena and Anaheim, but eventually, like since I was six, I grew up uh, in a town just north of LA called La Cunada, which is sort of this like um, upper middle class suburbia. Um, yeah, so I, I basically, I grew up there. Um, and I always wanted to be an animator or, or an artist, I mean, from the beginning. Um, my grandmother was a great oil painter, um, and uh, my friend's parents were great artists. My mom was a really good uh, illustrator also. She wasn't a professional illustrator, but she could draw really well. So um, art was always sort of in my, like, realm of possibilities. Like, I always knew it was sort of sort of an option to grow up and become an artist. I guess, you know, I grew up, I was like, I was always sort of the kid in the back of the class, drawing all over notebooks and my desk and stuff, even getting in trouble for it. But didn't really take too many, too many art classes. Um, always was into it. Not until high school um, when it became more serious. Um, and I still didn't really take art classes in high school. But I was really into like skateboards and skateboarding and skateboard graphics. And so I would like sort of, I had paint on my own decks. And then, um, which was, yeah, which was really cool. And then like I had this really great opportunity in high school where like the last two years I was in high school, we had this thing called options where, um, where you, could, you could skip your last period of, of the day uh, if you had a job. So basically, like, if you get your boss to sign off on at least five hours a week that you worked, um, you didn't have to go to your last period of class. So for two years, I did that, but I didn't have a job. So um, they let me, they, I convinced them to let me, if I could prove I did five hours of artwork a week, I could leave school early. So, so I did that, and it really pushed me to, like, make a daily habit out of being creative and drawing and stuff like that. But also like they would put my artwork up on the wall in the back of class. So, um, so that was cool too, because I'd have like an art show every week and all of my peers and stuff would check it out. And like, you know, it'd give me like a lot of respect or people would be like, what the hell is that? Or, or in any case, like got me in the habit of sort of like having art shows every week. Nice. Yes. Um, so that was cool. And it really got me motivated and, you know, peer pressure is a, is a, is a strong <laughs> thing, you know? Yeah. I started to build this portfolio of work because I did that for like two years. And I eventually got, while I was in high school, I got an internship at a graphic design studio. And it didn't last very long because I just sort of had this attitude and like I was taking smoke breaks and it wasn't like they wanted me to read my, uh, what was it called? My pocket pal. I don't know if you remember those. That um, was like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just basically like a graphic designer's little manual like for print and stuff like that, but I wouldn't read it. I just wanted to play in Photoshop. And that's when I first was introduced to Photoshop, which was like 1995. Um, but anyway, that didn't last very long, but I, it exposed me to that, um, which was like really, really fun. Um, and then I started, I started taking classes at, um, at Art Center in Pasadena for high school students on Saturdays. Um, so that was cool, like graphic design classes and things like that. And, um, and then they had this portfolio review at the end and they completely like destroyed my art and like, um, really, it really upset me. Like they just completely like discouraged me from, 
from pursuing art. Did you already have some um, sort of characters, like the ones that you, that you currently produce? Not really, no. I mean, I sort of had a style, like a really distinguishable line work. Um, it was less cartoony. It was more, um, you know, I had like, you know, I was a teenager. I had a lot of angst. I was like, a lot of my uh, my artwork would come from like uh, Black Flag lyrics or Dead Kennedys lyrics or like <laughs> just music I was into or or like, like again, like skateboard reference stuff. Um, and a lot of cartoons, too. Um, but it was a little bit more like if you look, we're look at it now or when I would show people then it's kind of creepy. And a lot of people, a lot of people's work in high school is totally creepy. That's you know? true. Yeah. It's dark and it's, oh, yeah. it's whatever, you know, no one uh, understands me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? So, but actually, you know, what I was really into at the time, um, was, uh, Frank Kozik's posters because oh, he was yeah. like, this was like the nineties, right? And he was putting out these like amazing rock posters and stuff and Coop too. Um, but anyway, so like I was completely discouraged. Like I was like, fuck this. Like I'm not going to art school. I, I had always wanted to go to art center in Pasadena. Um, but I didn't go. And, um, I ended up going to Humboldt state university up in, uh, way up in Northern California. It's like a six hour drive North from San Francisco. Yeah. So they're probably better known for like good weed than they are for their oh, school. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say up by the trees, but <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, it's where the redwoods meet the uh, the ocean. It's beautiful. It's it's awesome. But um, but yeah, you're like halfway between San Francisco and Portland. Um, they call it the you're behind the redwood curtain. But uh, but I was there for five years. Um, I studied sociology and studio art. Uh, was my minor. Um, I played in, I formed like a punk rock band. Um, we ended up playing like, um, like we, it was, it was totally DIY and we, uh, we even booked like a tour all over the U S one summer. Um, that's when like I really, I really learned to do like, like book my own stuff. It was almost like having art shows around, like just figuring out how to do all that stuff yourself, manage, sort of manage a career, you know, or manage, uh, manage an art career is really what a band is, you know? Um, but I was more into like doing that and doing like, like the, um, like the flyers and stuff than performing in a band, you know, and I wasn't, I'm not like a great musician or anything. That's Just what I was going to ask you. Were you doing the, were you, were you doing any of the flyers or any of the, uh, uh, artwork for merchandise and that kind of stuff? Yeah. Like that's what I was all about. Like I, I like that more than, than playing, you know? So yeah, so that got me back into art again, like doing that kind of stuff, um, really got me sort of amped up into it and and I was taking some art class I took a lot of like ceramics classes and stuff in college let's see after I graduated I moved back down to LA to my parents house I was looking for work doing as a graphic designer as a graphic artist um, and it was tough because I sort of screwed around all summer and then 9-11 happened oh, and man. nobody was hiring I mean it was like impossible to find you know like a, a job like that you know at least for a while so I just started building my portfolio. I was living for free at my parents' house. So I like was teaching myself how to paint, uh, just sort of building this portfolio so I could find you know a good job because I don't have a degree in graphic design. So but I needed a strong you know portfolio to back up or just to get my foot in the door, you know. So I ended up eventually getting uh, getting a job in uh, the fashion industry in this like company downtown downtown LA. Um, doing girls apparel, like t-shirts. Um, and they would sell it like JC Penney and Kohl's and Gottschalk's and Sears and stuff like that. So like really big accounts. Um, but I was just their in-house graphic artist. So I would just sort of do whatever they wanted. A lot of butterflies, a lot of tiaras and princess stuff and glitter. Um, it was junior girls. So it was like, it was sort of like preteen uh, yeah. graphics, you know, yeah. Yeah. and a lot of cute animals and stuff. And that's sort of how my style developed because I was doing a lot of cute animals. And at the time, Paul Frank had just sort of started and was really becoming like a big, uh, like fashion label. So everyone wanted, they wanted, they wanted me to do like a line of characters and just do all this Cupid, or Cupid, cute, stupid stuff. <laughs> Cupid. <laughs> that's probably where the name Cupid came from. You never know. <laughs> But I, I was I was still doing like a lot of art on the side and like um, doing underground art shows in downtown LA like Cannibal Flower, 
um, or at least I was starting to. So I would take, um, like, sort of like to like vent off some steam. I would like I would create my own cute characters and just put them in these sort of like fucked up situations or weird scenarios. Um, and that's just sort of how that started. And then um, the paintings would sell and I started, it started to go really, really well. Um, so eventually I quit my day job and just did artwork full time. I had like show art shows lined up in galleries and started designing toys. And, and uh, now I'm in it like, 10 years now as sort of uh, an artist and independent toy designer. Yeah. I'm definitely going to start asking you uh, some questions about toy design. I want to start with this though. You created these characters and then you've sort of used them to, to, to do these paintings and all these different series with the same characters involved. Was that even on your mind to, to start making toys based on those characters? Well, the, the characters came first and these sort of the artwork with the characters came first. But not long after, I sort of developed these characters, like my Mr. Bunny character, yeah. uh, my fire cat. Um, uh, not long after, I sort of, I didn't know about vinyl toys, but I walked in, I was up in San Francisco, and I just happened to walk into the Kid Robot store on Hay Street up there. And was like, my mind was blown. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, I could totally do this. Like, I've got my bunny character. Like, this could, like, this would be so much fun. Like, this would be great. You know, like, I would love to get involved in whatever the hell this is. Um, so I just sort of like, I um, just sort of started to get involved in that scene. And like, um, a kid robot opened in LA. Um, at the time, it was in Santa Monica. Um, and just started to get to know people and figure out who. Like eventually, like I found people that knew how to make toys, um, so sort of presented the idea to them to do a bunny toy, um, and we just sort of went from there. I didn't know a thing about designing toys, um, but I've, I've learned since then. So, how long was the process? I mean, from the time that you you found this new medium to when you started producing toys, like how long did that take? Was that sort of a long process? You know, where it involved you figuring it out, talking to people, making connections. It was, let's see. Well, I, I first walked into that store in 2002 and my first toy release was in 2005. So like three years, but I, 2004 was when I proposed the bunny character to Weedy Wee, uh, who was mm -hmm. the first company that I worked with. Um, at an art show because I had sculpted and figured out my bunny toy, this crude sculpt of Sculpty, um, and sort of presented it to him at the show. I invited him to the show, come check it out. And I, I painted this sort of prototype. Wow. Um, so he came to the art show and was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So that was 2004. So then, yeah, it took about a year uh, to further develop uh, the character and you know production and and everything. So it takes approximately approximately a year from the time you decide to make something. It usually takes about nine months. It's like having a baby if wow. everything goes well. So I just um, I started a figure in November, and it's shipping now, and it should arrive in about a month. So and this is a mass pro mass produced. Figure. Mass produced, yeah. It, it's like a, there's like a thousand, so eight months. So that's kind of a record for me. But I produced this one myself, so huh. that's a, that's a, like I found this is the first toy I've ever done like fully myself. That's a that I'm just finishing now, and it's so much faster and easier because there's no like usually when you're working with a toy company, they like to be the in between and they don't want you mm -hmm. to talk directly to the factory or yeah. and just having not having direct contact with the people you're working with is such um, uh, it slows things down, but it, it messes up communication and you don't know what your middleman is telling them or if everything's being communicated correctly or um, plus like I was just on it the whole time, you know, because it was my baby. I put my money in it like this and that. So I don't want to be the one to slow down production. So I'll just get back to them right away as soon as they get back to me. So you know, you're always moving things along and they're not waiting for you. Yeah. So how did you find those contacts? 
well, factories approached me years ago. Um, so that wasn't hard, but you can find factories now um, online um, or you, t people will tell you. Usually toy companies like to keep it top secret and they, they don't yeah. like to make that public. Um, but, um, but these guys came to me years ago, but I just couldn't afford to produce my own toy. Um, so I worked with you know other companies like Kid Robot, Loyal Subjects, Toy 2R, uh, Strange Co., people like that, um, which is great. Because, you know, they're putting up, you know, they're investing in it. But, yeah. but it, it is much nicer to be fully independent. That's oh, for yeah, sure. Absolutely. But, you know, I learned along the way. I mean, I've been doing this now for 10 years. So I, I figured out, you know, what works better um, shape-wise, uh, you know, for the art deco. Like, what are the limitations? Um, what I could get away with? What, you know, what are the things that sometimes can create an issue? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you know, experience is a good teacher. <laughs> yeah, definitely. When you work with other companies, with other toy, or toy companies, uh, <clears throat> do you work as, um, do you license your, your, your work? Basically, yeah. There's, it's a licensing, usually I have a licensing agreement. So they're basically licensing the work. But as like, since I'm doing art toys and I'm super hands-on, yeah. um, I sort of just do everything except for if I'm working with them, except for dealing with the factory. So like I'll develop it. I won't sculpt it, but I will develop it and super fine tune the turnarounds. Um, and usually there's an in-house sculptor at the factory, which I prefer, I prefer to do hand done sculpts. Um, so, so, and then usually it's a couple corrections and they've kind of got it. Um, and then I'll have them send me blanks. Um, once they're, the molds are finished and everything, and I'll just hand paint the blanks. Um, from there, I'll take photos of and you know, make turnarounds and and sort of trace them in Illustrator, do vector artwork, mm -hmm. um, and even sort of flatten it out so they can uh, they have the exact artwork that they need instead of sort of a perspective. Um, it's just it's completely nice. flattened out. You know, like a map or yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so. Versus a globe. Um, yeah, like the, uh, what is it, the world map that looks like a, a bunch of, or people have done it with uh, like orange peels, right? They open it up. Something yeah, like that. and it looks distorted. Right. But it's really how it is. Like, I, I do that so they can really figure out, they have the exact shape of the eye instead of sort of a weird angle of how the eye fits on a, on a, on a you know, a round shape, which isn't the true shape of the eye. Um, so, you know, I'll stretch it out like that. And once I have like the painted prototypes, sometimes if they're really difficult, I'll send them back to the factory and they can use those as sort of like, um, you know, uh, they can get the placement just right and, and it, they can compare it. Right. Um, but I like to keep them if I can. Um, and then I can photograph them for promotion. So even before they're even in production, I've got finished, you know, promo shots and, and things like that too. Awesome. So I'll do everything from, you know, from the initial design, art deco, promotional. Um, and you, but usually when like a toy company is doing it, like say they license Snoopy peanuts, they license the, uh, the uh, property. And then, um, and then that's peanuts is done. And the toy company We'll figure out the design, do everything in between, you know, basically, you know, do all the work. But, um, but I just take it out of their hands and I'll, I'll do it all because it's an art toy and it's, yeah. it's an artist toy, you know. Yeah. What, what would you tell a person that wants to get into that industry, to, to, to get into toys in general? It's a real good idea to spend a lot of time developing a design um, and live with it for a little while before you move forward to the next step. Um, because it seems to me that, like, when I look at what's released these days in the whole sort of scene, you can tell that there's pieces that people have spent a lot of care and time developing, um, and some that were pretty, uh, pretty hasty. Um, and it really shows, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, these, are big in these can be big investments. So you, you yeah. also you want them to sell. You want them to do well. You want to be noticed. Um, you want to stand out from the crowd. 
Um, and you want to have, you know, you have your own sort of goals in, in the design too. Um, so that would be my, I think the best advice would be really spend, spend time developing something strong because that's the foundation where, where it can grow from. Is it an industry where anyone could sort of just jump in if they have good work, they have good art that they could um, produce toys out of? Or if they have good art and they want to produce toys, do you think it's a, it's, I don't know, a good industry to move into? Well, exactly. Well, yes. And... It's Sorry about the, my long-winded question there. No, no, no the but I totally understand. It's <laughs> basically like the way I see it, this, that's how the scene started. The scene started with great, amazing, super talented artists. You know, people like Kaz, Gary Baseman, Tim Biska, amazing artists. And then, you know, making a 3D version of their, of their artwork. Um, so there was sort of like with, with these toys, there's sort of a backstory. Um, there might not be, these toys aren't from a cartoon. They're not from like, um, like, a like a mainstream, you know, movie or something, but they're from, they're from an art, uh, they come from somewhere else. They come from fine art. Um, and they're sort of like, uh, they're limited edition. So they're sort of like 3d prints. Um, but I think now a lot of those artists have stopped making toys. Why have they stopped? Um, well, I think, well, first of all, there's not, unless you're producing your own toys, there's really not a lot of money in it. And there's a, and a lot of time goes into it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think that, I think that the smarter artists stopped a long time ago. Um, just for that reason, because they'd rather be doing other things. Yeah. Um, you know, and you get busy and, you know, a lot of artists like they're, you know, their priorities are not making toys. Their priorities are the, their next art show, you know, or pushing this, uh, pushing their artwork to the next level. Um, so it's, it's to some artists, it's sort of like merchandise. It's like making a T-shirt. Okay. Uh, so, but, you know, some have stuck around, that's for sure. I stuck around. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of stuff, too, that you'll just see, and it's just sort of like there's nothing... Uh, there's no art story behind it. You know what I mean? Like, if, if you just start um, from, if you just start out as a toy artist, it's just a lot more difficult, I think, because there's no frame of reference for for what you're for what you're uh, trying to sell. You know, because in the end, it is a product, and it's they got to sell, otherwise, you're not going to make it anymore. You know. So I I think you know artwork or like even underground comic or something uh, that you can point to that said this it's from this this is what it is oh okay that makes it a story that makes it you know it legitimizes it so are you are you gonna continue doing making toys you know what I was starting to lose interest for a little while really and I was until I designed my I, I financed designed and took on my own production and it like completely rejuvenated my interest in this like wow. It's it's like I'm super excited. I've got all these new projects I'm excited about. So um, yeah, because it was just starting to get a little bit uh, a little bit boring. It was it's a lot of work for not a lot of money. Um, you can't make a living just being a toy artist, and you know. So, um, but but um, but yeah. I mean, it, it, being more involved in financing these myself and. And uh, being able to control the marketing and, and all those aspects um, is is huge. Um, so that's that's really it's really like uh, sort of a rebirth for me right now. Awesome. What what other kind of things are you doing these days? Well, I'm doing a lot of custom uh, toys. Um, I made this resin bunny that I made 40 of, and they're about a foot tall. And so each one I'll paint, um, like customize um, a different type of bunny. So that's taken me a few years now. Um, I don't I don't constantly do those, but um, I'm on number 25 out of 40. So I'm sort of you know beyond the halfway point. Um, but I'm cranking those out. Those are just um, sort of private commissions. I'm doing a lot of private commissions 
Um, I'm doing, I'm starting to develop some more 2D, 3D weird uh, wood sculpture things, um, which are sort of in development right now. Um, they're all hand done. And uh, what else? You know, I, I stopped doing gallery shows also. <laughs> They're right now. That's cool. I stopped doing gallery shows also because, you know, I just, I'm really on this kick of just being totally independent. And I started doing all these art shows and I would sell a lot of work, but they were all to sort of, they were, everyone that would buy my work were people I was already in contact with. So it's like, well, I might as well just do like my own show, you mm -hmm. know? Um, the gallery seems weird. It's like gallery scene, galleries are great if you're up and coming. And they're great if you're like this um, high level artist, but in the middle with the internet now, um, it's sort of pointless. I, I think they're obsolete. Really? Uh, oh yeah. I mean, cause I can go, I can go rent a space for a week on Melrose and open a pop-up gallery. Ah. You know, it's a little bit more work, but they don't take 50%, you know? Wow. So you might as well just take it in your own hands. And that's what a lot of artists are doing right now, right? They're, you know, I haven't seen too much of that, but they should be. You know, that's my plan. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, just because, like, you know, a lot of galleries don't bring anything to the table. Um, now, the higher one, the higher end ones do, um, and they reach people that you probably couldn't reach without them. And you know, when you're just getting started, I mean, you need you need to build your name, you need to build your gallery reputation. But if you're a, like a mid career artist. Uh, with the internet and 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 being able to to figure out how to do it yourself, I mean, I don't think there's any point. So you're about to you're about to revolutionize the scene. Yeah, no, <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I hope not me, but I hope the scene. I hope the scene. Uh, you know, takes. I ha I hope artists take more initiative and just become more independent because they. You could make a. I think you can make a better living without without middlemen. You know, I mean, you need the only the only problem is uh, is you need uh, you need some money up front. That's the only thing in your way. So, and sometimes it, it doesn't have to be that much. I mean, you you know, for uh, to rent a space, I mean, you just need to pay you know rent for whatever and maybe some sort of insurance cost. Um, Usually for about a week or two, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would probably do it for two weeks. Um, take a few days for setup and then have the show up for, you know, a week and a half and also sell like product, you know? Oh, definitely. And then that's, that's, that's a benefit right there for you, especially cause you have, you have a whole line of pro products. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can, if you can, you can even spend money, um, you know, getting the word out there, you can hire, um, like press people, you know? So, so yeah, yeah I mean, that's the plan. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I love it. I love it. So right now that you're talking about uh, being independent, um, what, would, what would your one piece of advice be for anyone who would like to follow uh, that route, go, go in that direction? Anybody that wants to uh, pursue their um, art career, design career, and something in a creative field? Well, first of all, <clears throat> uh, stick with it. Um, if it if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. So, you know, I, I would take, take comfort in that. Um, take comfort that's hard. Um, because then, you know, then everyone would be doing it. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, find your strengths and really just try to become the best in the world at your, your strengths. I mean, if it's like the smallest thing, if you're really good at drawing fingers, you'd be the best finger drawer there is, you know, like at least, set that as a goal, you know, and, and uh, you don't have to be good at everything, you know, but, but I guess it's just a way to find your niche and to stand out, which is important because there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of artists doing a lot of different things and, and you really need to have some sort of identity. I mean, some people see it as like a gimmick, but you really need something, uh, to where people read that, that it's you. Um, and then from there they can take any kind of message they want or any kind of message you want to give them, but you, you do need to have something distinctive that sets yourself apart. Um, you know, find good role models. Um, people that you may know or may not know, 
um, that you really admire um, and sort of let their careers push you. Um, like I've, I've always looked up to Tim Bisco ever since I started and just keeping up, oh, what's he doing? Oh, what's that show? Oh man, I, you know, and like trying to, trying to get to his level, which I'll never reach because he just keeps getting better and better and higher and higher. But at least, at least you have someone like that or somebody else too that just like pushes you, uh, whether they know it or not, because he doesn't know that, but whether they know it or not, like somebody that can really, you know, motivate you um, and, and inspire you. You know, if, if you want something done right, um, you know, find a way to make it happen yourself. Um, the internet's great for that, the Google and stuff like that. So, and it's always good to learn how to do, how to do a lot of stuff. It opens up a lot of doors. Um, and you, you never want to wait for someone to help to help you or wait for, you know, something like that. Just go for it. Just do it. You know, um, also learn how to start a business. It's not that hard, you know, but you need to figure it out. Um, and that's sort of like starting a foundation, like when you're designing a toy or even like, I do that with painting too. Like if I'm, if I'm starting a painting, I'll spend a lot of time just figuring out what exactly it's going to be um, before I start to sort of execute it. Um, I mean, that's just how I work. But, um, but yeah, I mean, get a DBA or an LLC and learn like all the tax stuff, what you need to pay, city, state, federal, all that stuff. Um, just so you don't get in trouble in the future and you've just got yourself a nice, you know, home base. Um, yeah. And you got to put in the hours. Um, you get out what you put into it, you know. Um, and the more the more creative you are, the more creative you become. It's sort of like a snowball. So um, you don't really wait for ideas or inspiration to come to you. Um, just stay busy, and you'll never have the problem of coming up with ideas. You know, you have more ideas than you know what to do with. So, so that's my advice. I'm going, to, I'm going to have that all in the show notes too, by the way. Uh, so so everyone, you, everyone, you can find that uh, on pencilvspixel.com forward slash Joe Ledbetter. So that's pencilvspixel.com slash Joe Ledbetter. So Joe, uh, what kind of, do you have any books that have helped you in, in your career? Anything that you would, uh, that you think would help any other visual artist or designer? Well, you know, like I, I read a lot of, but we'll have a lot of art books. Um, and I read everything in those art books. Sometimes there's not much to read. Um, but especially if you can read something written, like by an artist written by that artist, um, because you can get into their head at least a little bit. Um, but um, there's a couple books that I've read recently, which were I thought were pretty cool. Um, one is called The War of Art. I think it's a pretty oh. popular book, but it's... it's That's a good one. It, it's, I, I enjoyed it. Um, and another one is, you know, a great book that surprisingly not a lot of people know about, but at least that's people that I come across, is um, sort of the Graphic Artist Guild Handbook for uh, what's the pricing and ethical guidelines. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because um, awesome. people are always asking me, like, how, like, oh, I was approached by a... Uh, it's an old version. Exactly. I yeah. have that version. Yeah, this is they, a good yeah, They come out with a new version every year, I think, yeah. you know, or every other year. Um, but yeah, cause people are always asking me like, um, Oh, a record label will approach me and I don't know what to ask for, or, you know, I'm working with this book publisher, you know, that book will give you, you know, ballpark figures and sort of a guideline of how to work, uh, you know, with different, um, you know, different industries and, and what, what your expectations should be and stuff like that. Um, so that's a pretty invaluable book, you know, at least in the design world. Um, and, you know, there's another book I just picked up called How to Think Like a Great Graphic Designer. Uh, and it's, it's just a series of interviews um, with, like, legendary graphic artists, um, like, you know, Milton Glaser and stuff like that. So it's pretty insightful just because it's like I, I like books where you get into the mind of, of the artist or the designer. Like, you hear their own words and, oh, yeah, totally. and really get a sense of... Uh, you know, like where they come from and how they get things done and, you know, stuff like that. So I just picked up, um, I haven't started it yet, but I just picked up the new Jim Henson biography. So I'm, I'm ready to dig into that. But, um, 
but that's not that's not his words. It's it's his biographer, so it's a little different. But very cool, very cool. Thank you for sharing those uh, those books. Where where can we find you, Joe, online? Well, if you go to joeledbetter.com, you can find like everything about me there because um, it's got links to my uh, my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, and I think you can get to my YouTube page from there, which we're starting to do more sort of videos, um, you know, like high speed me painting or, you know, like me, how, like my process of making a designer toy. So everything basically is at joeledbetter.com. Awesome. Awesome. And, and you'll be able to find, uh, links to his website, everything we talked about today, uh, all the books that he shared on pencil versus pixel.com slash Joe Ledbetter. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Really, really appreciate it. And um, thank you, everyone, for being here today. And we'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you.